Okay, our lesson today for the Corne Project class, I'll just title it, uh, When Your Lordship Sinks. It's just a catchy little title playing off the word ship, and then, of course, uh, sink, meaning it didn't fare well. There's quite a controversy. It's been ongoing for more than a decade, but a young pastor was preaching, and he was saying that if you are born again, born from above, that inevitably you will uh, demonstrate or conduct, carry out good works. So he was speaking of it as inevitable, but he had placed it in what we would call a binary yes or no. You either affirm good works or you deny good works. But we know in this class as learning to think and have our minds scripted by the text, saying you're for good works or against good works doesn't mean that any work about which you're speaking under the superordinate category of good works is anything being done or accomplished. It's similar to some people pick that God picked them and other people pick that God didn't pick them, but it doesn't mean the purpose for which God uh, reasons out one of his disciples for a particular purpose uh, to carry out his work is even being accomplished or understood. So let's look very quickly here for just a moment. I went ahead and translated out Ephesians 2.10 because there's a couple of major things in this text I'd like to show. And this is uh, for we are, that's a form of aiming, a product, poema. I think a transliteration is like our word poem, poema, a product of him. And this is an uh, aorist passive participle. After we were created, in Christ Jesus, now here's the uh, text I'll call attention to, upon good works, notice this word epi, upon, and here's good works, agathos, agathois, which is locative because of the preposition, the word preposition prior. Uh, agathos means something beneficial, beneficial, it's that kind of work, we're not talking about works of law, we're talking about here specifically something unique. Now this is a, a letter to the church in Ephesus. So this is about the Ecclesia. It goes on to say, Upon which works the God, well, which works the God previously prepared. So these are previously prepared works, the works which upon which God previously prepared in order that in them we might conduct. So let's stop here for a minute and look at this preposition, this preposition peri, peri, that's uh, prescribed. So let's notice number one, epi, and then number two, peri. These are prepositions in your preposition chart, you remember, those of you that are using this, you have epi up here, and it's a contact word. Of course, peri is the circle, so I'll just write it like that. But notice what this does. This circumscribes the good works, and this, this establishes There, so we have this now where we can notice, for example, when uh, I heard a preacher, uh, I think he's quite popular, if not famous, a uh, Paul Washer, Washer, Paul Washer. I'm from Arkansas, so Washer would be something we might say. Uh, but he was speaking of the inevitability of good works by those who are born again, born from above, regenerated. Uh, but earlier in his life, you know, when I first heard of him several years ago, he was speaking of how you can say God, but not which God or who God is. You can mention Jesus, but not which Jesus. And you can say gospel, but not which gospel. Well, if you keep going with that, that's where the issue of lordship salvation really became very uh, highly charged. Even the term lordship, the phrase lordship salvation, which even advocates of it have are people were associated with the term because when it comes to qualifying it, now that's where we start seeing the ship sink. 
and that's a pun intended, because, for example, if our work is circum, if, if these this conduct is circumscribed, and it is, and if the it's established that it's upon good works previously prepared, that the God previously prepared, and it's intended for us to notice that, well, then let's go to the gospel, which you notice Jesus, the gospel of John, that's the ordained uh, message of persuasion. So we've exhausted that. So we have that. That's number one. We've got that checked off our list. You trust Jesus Christ for everlasting life. You have eternal life. You trust him for eternal salvation. You have eternal salvation. You trust him for everlasting life. Number two, baptism. We noticed in, well, even in this letter, uh, Ephesians. Let's just move this way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 says they were all baptized into Moses. Romans 6 says we're baptized into Christ. Ephesians 5.32 says that uh, Christ, that is the ecclesia. Christ, that is the ecclesia. Now you notice this starts really giving a rationale for a flock of sheep, for example, subjects of a king, citizens in a kingship. Uh, it starts speaking of the body of which the head is its savior, the head and the body. So we're baptized into Christ, that is the ecclesia. That would be our second thing. But when you speak of baptism, we'll talk about what kind and what should someone say. Let's say in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Some teach that we should say that in the service of baptism. But then who does the baptizing and who is the candidate. You see, when you mention lordship and you speak of good works and we talk about things that are inevitable, that's not for us to then be allowed to attribute to that phrase, good works or lordship, whatever's in our own mind. Uh, that's the responsibility of the herald, the preacher, the one who's preaching and teaching all of this, because without that, we don't have anything scripted. Nothing is established and there is nothing circumscribed accordingly. And so staying with the script, we move on with this person who's now baptized into Christ, that is the ecclesia. He's already believed into Jesus, Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2.16. So we believe, punctured our action, I'll just write it like that. Believe into Jesus Christ. We are baptized into Christ and actually so we see we believe in Jesus Christ the person we're baptized into Christ the ecclesia and of course now let's pick up with several things here steadfast continuance in the apostles doctrine this is Acts 2.42 fellowship this is uh, communion uh, it's actually the word koine, koine, union. Isn't that interesting? So we have koine union, a common union. But now notice that common union is the result of the steadfast continuance in the apostles' doctrine. So we can go ahead and just drop number three here and just reference up here. Then we have this common union. Now, also in Philippians chapter 1, verse 5, it says our fellowship into the gospel. So notice here we have believing in Jesus Christ, baptized into Christ, that is the ecclesia. That's Ephesians 5, 32. Then it speaks of a apostle's doctrine. That's all the... New Testament for us. There we go. And then we have the fellowship into the gospel. That's Philippians 1, 5. That's actually the good work that God has begun among us 
in us that he would be faithful to continue. So we then have that conjoined here. So this was conjoined. This fellowship is catechismic. That is according to the teaching. Paul used that word catechize in Galatians. It's sound according to an echo. So we're able to sound back the teaching when we have collaborative uh, learning and teacher-student relationship. We collaborate. Uh, Landmark, we always are discussing collaborating saying, hey, have you heard this? And what about that? And we're comparing and listening and learning and iron sharpening iron, so to speak. So our fellowship is conjoined to this. And now we have this, which is still conjoined here in the English. This is the Lord's Supper. So we have five here. Now that involves self-examine, self-examine, and self-correct. Self-correction, that involves um, the, a father, for example, would examine himself in light of his, as he is a, as a father, is he raising his children in the nurture and admission of the Lord? Uh, is he, as the book of Ephesians states, this letter to the ecclesia, this church letter, says that we are to be submitting ourselves one to another. So the husband submits himself to the wife by laying down his life for her like Christ loved the church. So he loves her like that, demonstrably and actually uh, in an established manner, in a circumscribed manner. So they self-examine, self-corrects where he is in what we call, uh, he's improving, he's growing, he's developing, he's maturing. And the children are growing and developing and maturing. They're watching their parents come along with them to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They're self-examining, self-correcting. For example, the father takes cup and bread and gives to his uh, the children's mother in front of the children where they watch this take place. And then he gives cup and bread to his baptized children there that are entered into that covenant, having believed the gospel, trusted Christ for everlasting life, believed into Jesus, and now been baptized into Christ, that is the exilicia, and are now in child training, the apostles' doctrine, the New Testament teachings, and are now part of the fellowship into the gospel. Self-correction. Now, in the prayers, oh my, I'm running out of board, so just go there. And we can notice the prayers of Jesus, what he taught us how to pray. We can go through and see the prayers for one another. We can see the reciprocity where we pray for one another. We can see the submission to one another. We see fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 where the love of the Spirit, the joy of the Spirit, the peace of the Spirit, like for example, the love of the Spirit is reciprocal love, not just some world concept of saying love and affection, but it's love of the Spirit. As Jesus said, love one for another with a love that is reciprocal is of the Spirit. The joy cause or base of gladness is what Jesus gave his students, which was to do his Father's will. So for them and for us, the ecclesia, our cause or base of gladness, that is joy, is to accomplish the Father's will, serve the interests of Christ, which to assure that his Father is glorified in the ecclesia by Christ Jesus. So that just goes on and on. Even the word peace in Ephesians refers to the seamless um, relationship we have as being fitly framed. So we could just go on and on. And then, of course, the Lord's Prayer taught us how to pray. Uh, we're told in several of the church letters what we should pray for. Jesus even taught us to go to his Father in Jesus' name. Now we can go to seven. There's the Great Commission. All this is disciple making. Here's eight, assembling ourselves together. Here's nine, exhorting one another. This, of course, would be where we even bear each other's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. So that's a lot. But if you're speaking in terms of the Lord's Supper or baptism, and you'll notice when people talk, these are somewhat disconnected. And it represents a lack of circumscription. This is uh, diagram uh, diagrammatically uh, reflects and indicates what are our boundaries? This is scribe from what we would have produces a script. But when you then talk about Lordship Salvation, a superordinate category, 
and then people reserve the right to just say up or down, yes or no, but don't notice how substantial this is in reference to the uh, ecclesia, the Lord's church, and what gospel are you believe into Jesus? Simple form of action. You trust him for everlasting life. How much more could John the baptizer and Jesus the Christ have made it so clear in the gospel intended to persuade us that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believe when I have life in his name, baptized into Christ. We already had the type in the Old Testament. I mean, I could just preach this all day and iterate it, reiterate it, encourage people. And then that's why in the ecclesia, we grow up to the full measure of the stature of Christ. We become conformed to his image, that body of Christ does. And again, there is no fruit of the Spirit in the ecclesia that isn't reciprocal, uh, that isn't interdependent with each other and one another. So this is a lot to say. It's just that really, I, I think that Lordship has sailed and more concerning to me as a pastor, it's probably sunk by now because it, it can be something people just tout. And when you say Lordship or you say yes or no, uh, someone born from above will exemplify and demonstrate good works. Well, we have even prescriptions for restoring someone that's overtaken in a fault church letter to the churches in Galatia. We have in Corinthians people who were refusing to repent and persisting in their sin, but yet they were in the ecclesia to receive correction. We know that. We've already studied that. So that's enough. But this is what happens. Uh, your lordship sinks if it's just an empty, vain word. And that would not be a good work. Because what I just did was to demonstrate what would be a good work of a pastor be? What would be something that would establish what I do as a teacher as a good work, beneficial work? Well, just think of what would happen and what does happen to families. I've seen people move from what the world has made of them into what Christ has made of them. I pastored multiple churches in the same location and can tell you the church now that's there exemplifies these things and in both knowledge and in practice, so in word and in deed. So you have a blessed day and enjoy this lesson. Enjoy the good work that I demonstrated in producing the lesson and then give you something to think about. So when you hear Lordship Salvation, don't pick sides. That's empty. When you hear, well, will someone who's born again produce good works or not? That's empty until we describe and circumscribe what that is and teach it. So have a blessed day. Enjoy the lesson.